The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. I want to thank all of you attending the 2013 Members Only Town Hall webinar. My name is Tab Randolph. I'm president of IBA Cal, IIAB Cal, excuse me, and I will be leading today's webinar. With me today is Clark Payen, IIAB Cal Chief Executive Officer, and Steve Young, IIAB Cal General Counsel. Before we begin, I want you to know that there will be a question and answer session following today's presentation. We look forward to answering any and all questions you might have. Because there are more than 100 members participating in today's webinar, we muted your phones to eliminate any potential background noise during the presentation. Please submit any questions in writing through the GoToMeeting toolbar that should appear on the right-hand side of your browser. You should have received an email yesterday outlining today's webinar agenda and background materials. If you didn't receive this email, you can access the webinar material at www.iiabcal.org or by clicking on the agenda and by clicking on the agenda icon at the top of the page and going to members only town hall upcoming meetings. Let's get started. The California Legislature and the Department of Insurance were busy places in 2013, and there is more of the same ahead and expected in 2014. That means that we've got to be prepared for the unexpected as well as the expected. We're always one morning headline, as Steve Young likes to say, one morning headline away from dealing with a crisis. If we have to react, it's typically too late. Whether we're playing offense or defense, we have a lobbying team in place and a PAC that supports legislators, that support IIAB Cal's public policy objectives, and project or excuse me, and protect your business interests. Your voice is being heard in Sacramento. And now I'd like to introduce Steve Young, who will provide additional details about our legislative affairs, as well as a few comments regarding Covered California. Steve? Hey, thanks, Tab, and good morning, everyone. Really glad you can join us today. Um, I've been asked to, to spend just a few moments to uh, review briefly uh, what happened in the 2013 legislature, and uh, I don't want to say that I want to forecast, but at least mention what we're kind of expecting in 2014. Um, last year, uh, or I guess this year, the 2013 legislature was in many ways the beginning of a new era uh, in California politics and in the California legislature. Uh, there were over 2,300 bills introduced, which is actually down pretty significantly from past totals. And of that 2,300, 805 were ultimately passed by the legislature and signed into law by Governor Brown. Probably didn't think or realize that we needed 800 new statutory laws, but that number is actually down significantly for most years. There's a number of reasons why last year was really the beginning of a new era, and much of it owes to the initiative process. Uh, you, you'll remember that Prop 14 a few years ago created the top two primary system, or the so-called open primary, where the two top vote getters in a primary election, regardless of their party uh, its affiliation, would advance to the general. Uh, so in many cases, we had two Democrats running against uh, each other or two Republicans running against each other in the general election. And the point of that initiative was to hopefully require all uh, successful legislative candidates to tack more to the middle uh, than to the extremes of their particular parties. Uh, Prop 20 was the redistricting initiative, which changed the legislative and congressional districts to make them more competitive in areas where the numbers of, of Republicans, Democrats were pretty close. Uh, Prop 28 expanded the term limits uh, initiatives so that members of the legislature could stay in one chamber rather than serve one or two terms in one chamber and then immediately run for the other one to keep their political life alive. And the other big thing that happened, of course, was Prop 30, 
which was the temporary tax initiative, which increased state revenues and eliminated the need for really painful and very contentious budget fights. In large part because of all of these other changes, there were 38 brand new members of the legislature last year. To put that in context, that's almost one in every three legislators. Uh, there's a 120-person legislature. So almost one in every three was brand new uh, to that process. And uh, as a result of all of these changes, it was a definitely a slower, less contentious uh, year and a smoother year, as you all know, in the legislative process. One of the consequences of that, though, uh, is that traditional Democratic Party uh, constituencies, and I include in that plaintiffs' lawyers, organized labor, were to a large degree very frustrated. You know, the, the other big change that happened last year is that the Democratic Party, one party, had supermajority control of not only all of the constitutional offices in California, but both houses of the legislature. And so Republicans were, uh, in the budget process and in every other process, largely irrelevant, frankly, uh, in the legislative process. And I think there was a, a fear uh, on the part of many in the business community uh, and a, a fervent hope uh, on some of the more leftward uh, fringes of the Democratic Party that this would be the year that wholesale sweeping radical reforms, tax increases, uh, other uh, measures that would be very anti-business could get kind of rammed through. But in fact, none of that happened. Uh, the legislature itself was fairly constrained, and Governor Brown used his veto pen uh, or the threat of a veto fairly liberally there to keep the legislature in line. What the open question is, uh, as we head into 2014, is whether this relative magnanimity in the legislative process and whether this relative moderation was a one-year aberration <laughs> or whether it uh, sort of foretells uh, a new uh, sort of larger era in the way the legislature of California works. We're going to have to wait and see. But because of this frustration that especially plaintiffs' lawyers and labor uh, felt through the legislative process, that means there's going to be even more pressure in the year ahead, not only in the legislature but also in the November uh, 2014 uh, uh, general election ballot. And I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to, I'm going to jump for just a moment into 2014 before I come back to talk about Covered California and health care, uh, which was the one set of issues that really dominated what did come out of the legislature. In 2014, we know already that there are going to be at least two really major insurance-related initiatives. The first is on MICRA, the medical malpractice uh, uh, limits. You may remember that in the 1970s, in response to a very severe crisis in the affordability and availability of medical malpractice liability insurance, the legislature passed what at the time was a very uh, groundbreaking, almost radical reform that limited, that imposed specific caps on non-economic damages, or pain and suffering damages for medical malpractice liability actions, They're like $250,000 basically per incident. Those caps have never been adjusted since the 1970s. And so plaintiffs, lawyers, and other consumer groups, frustrated because they haven't been able to get anything out of the legislature, have qualified for the November 2014 ballot uh, a measure that would increase those caps and would provide for a sort of continual cost of living adjustment. Curiously, they have coupled that concept with uh, a number of uh, provisions designed to uh, uh, regulate or, or, or limit what doctors can do. There would be a, a requirement that, that physicians do drug and alcohol testing there would be a requirement that they use a centralized uh, reporting service whenever they prescribe uh, controlled substances uh, for patients, and a number of other limitations that the doctors themselves really hate. They really don't like, and so doctors themselves are likely to be one of the uh, 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 primary opponents of this initiative. The other big initiative that we're going to be dealing with uh, directly con 
concerns health insurance and the process by which health insurance companies change the prices that they charge. Uh, right now, as you know, in California, we have kind of a, a curious system where the Department of Insurance regulates uh, PPOs and the Department of Managed Health Care uh, regulates HMOs. And the regulation of these two different types of health insurers are uh, subject to co really completely different regulatory schemes in addition to different political considerations. But in both cases, there is very little control uh, over the rates that insurers charge. They have to file the rates they want to use, but the insurance commissioner has no authority to say no. Uh, we know that this commissioner and some of his predecessors have used their bullet pulpit to pressure insurers either not to uh, uh, raise rates or to moderate rates or to delay rate increases. But he actually has virtually no authority to actually prevent or deny a rate increase. And that will change uh, if uh, an initiative, which will be on the November uh, 2014 ballot, uh, is approved. It would impose a Prop 103 type system of prior approval uh, resting uh, squarely in the California Insurance Commissioner's office. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, it's an initiative that uh, is very, very bad uh, for the health insurance marketplace, very bad for agents, but very bad for consumers, too, if you look at the experience of Prop 103. Uh, Prop 103, of course, uh, back in 1988, replaced a system of open competition in, prior, in property casualty uh, rates with a system of prior approval. And uh, the prior approval law itself, uh, which Prop 103 enacted, and the one which was being proposed uh, for health insurance, in and of itself isn't unlike, it's not all that uh, extreme, it's not all, all that unlike systems that exist in other states, but the particular twist in California that has been very bad has been the provision that permits any interested consumer group to file a petition to intervene in any rate change request, either a rate increase or a rate decrease. Because the way the process has worked in California is that these consumer groups uh, basically object to any change, any change whatsoever that's proposed, even rate decreases, because they want larger rate decreases than the insurer has filed for. And what happens is that it slows the entire process down, literally by years, and it adds an enormous expense because these consumer groups intervene in part uh, because they then can make a request for the reimbursement of all of their attorneys and all of their so-called expert witness testimony and other involvement in these hearings. So the very groups that are promoting this initiative are the ones that have literally uh, taken millions and millions and millions of dollars for themselves out of this rate approval process. Um, it's, uh, the, the conflict of interest uh, here is staggering, and there is, frankly, uh, no empirical evidence to suggest that uh, these rate approval laws actually result in lower prices to consumers. Uh, so you can probably tell from my comments here that I, I'm not a fan of these laws, uh, but it's going to be a huge, huge battle for the insurance industry in part because of discontent over the continuing turmoil in the health insurance marketplace. And, and that really sort of brings me to um, covered California and to uh, what is probably the most uh, radical change in any insurance marketplace that we've seen in at least a quarter of a century, and that is the implementation now uh, of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, of course, that the rollout in California has gone substantially better, substantially more smoothly than it has nationally. Uh, IIAB Cal and our colleagues at the California Association of Health Underwriters and NAFA California have been working very hard uh, behind the scenes for the last year and a half to ensure that agents would have an opportunity and a very meaningful opportunity to sell covered California policies to help their customers continue in this new health insurance world, uh, satisfy their uh, clients' uh, benefits and health insurance-related uh, needs. And I think we've, we've 
done a pretty good job of doing that. We have a system now in place where uh, the relationship between agents and health insurance companies in the individual marketplace is largely, or at least to as much as possible, uh, unchanged or uninterfered with by the exchange mechanism itself. Uh, we have a system uh, in the shop exchange or small um, health, uh, a small business health options plan, where uh, agents will be the primary distribution channel, and there will be requirements that agents uh, receive market competitive commissions for their services there. Uh, curiously. Uh, uh, you know, we, we have found over the last two or three months uh, a, a number of circumstances that I don't think I would have necessarily predicted uh, when we were thinking about how this uh, whole new system would roll out. We, we've seen California Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones actually tell uh, the public that if they have questions about Covered California, they should go to a licensed independent agent for advice rather than going to the exchange itself. Uh, we have uh, the uh, exchange itself um, giving leads to certified insurance agents, uh, even though they have their own customer service people and you can get these policies online and there are all sorts of unlicensed navigators and others who can also help customers. So we, we've seen that the sort of powers that be recognize inherently the tremendous value uh, of the independent agent in the marketplace and especially as we move towards the uh, very fast approaching now the first deadline for uh, registering for uh, coverage uh, open you know the open enrollment deadline in the individual marketplace we're seeing uh, agents uh, play I think and have the opportunity to play a very significant role in all that with that visibility comes some criticism and some problems. Uh, the rollout in California has not been perfect. Uh, some, uh, for example, of the online processes that agents uh, have to use to get their customers enrolled has not worked very well in California, which has required the uh, uh, implementation of paper submissions, which has been just as problematic and inefficient as you can imagine. Uh, we have some uh, uh, politicians, I'm, I'm trying to be polite here, uh, criticize uh, agent involvement. Uh, our uh, distinguished lieutenant governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, has been critical publicly of the fact that Covered California was actually giving uh, leads to certified insurance agents, even though the consumers requested you know, information you know, uh, about Covered California to be given to them. So th there's going to be c some continued bumps in the road. Uh, just in the last week, there has been some evidence uh, suggesting that uh, employees in the customer service centers of Covered California, uh, when they find out that a customer is using an agent, have actually tried to uh, encourage the customers to drop their agent. Uh, and uh, when Covered California management heard that and documented that that was happening. They immediately took action to stop that practice and to make sure that uh, uh, that did not uh, happen again. So they're going to continue to be these bumps in the road. But so far, at least in California, we think uh, the rollout has been a little bit more smooth than in other places. The one last thing I want to say about the exchange concerns the individual uh, marketplace. Uh, the president has gotten himself in a lot of trouble by speaking rather imprecisely when he said uh, that uh, anyone who had coverage in the private marketplace who was satisfied with their coverage uh, would not be required uh, to buy exchange policies. And of course, we know that's not really necessarily true, that the way the federal law was written, uh, all health insurance companies were required to uh, you know, effective January 1, uh, write policies, sell products that conformed to minimum Affordable Care Act standards in terms of certain essential health benefits, you know, had to be covered, uh, no pre-existing condition exclusion, uh, other things. And for reasons I won't bore you with on this call, a certain number of policies were grandfathered in under the old rule. Some were and some were not. 
And so when the president spoke about you can keep the policy you want, he was talking about uh, you know, uh, employer-provided small group policies, and he was talking about uh, the category of individual market policies that were grandfathered in for you know one year basically under the old rules. But there are potentially millions of additional consumers in California, let alone millions more nationally, that in fact have received uh, policy cancellations from health insurers required under the federal law. And uh, you may remember a few weeks ago, the president held a big press conference where he strongly encouraged uh, the states, uh, state exchanges, and health insurers to continue to write these old policies for one more year. And the Cover California Board of Directors, in a, in a I think, a fairly courageous uh, political decision, basically uh, said no. Uh, that they were not going to kick the can down the road, that they recognized that uh, there were uh, there were going to be a, there's going to be a price to pay and some significant market dislocation by continuing with these cancellations. But they just felt I think that we were too far down the road in implementation. The insurers themselves had no effective way to suddenly reverse course this late in the game. And uh, so the, the board voted to basically ignore uh, what Insurance Commissioner Jones was saying and ignore what the president was saying to just go ahead, bite the bullet, and, uh, and have as much of the sort of dislocation that's inherent in a, any change in a marketplace this big to just sort of take effect and for the process to continue to work. Um, it's going to be interesting to see as um, that change takes effect uh, in the coming year, what that does to the overall public perception of covered California and the public perception about uh, the Affordable Care Act and overall consumer satisfaction with health insurance uh, generally. Uh, and I mention that because it has, I think, a direct impact on the 2014 initiative that I mentioned insur earlier on health insurance rates. If uh, people who are currently insured who overwhelmingly tend to be voters uh, on a regular basis are really mad about price increases or really unhappy about changes that they feel were foisted on them, it may be very difficult for them to understand that this health insurance rate initiative is unrelated uh, to you know, the problems they're having. And that in fact, it would make it worse. But people may be just angry enough over their health insurance rates and other changes that they're inclined to vote for this stupid uh, health insurance rate law just because they feel it's something they can do you know, to kind of get back or address their frustration. Um, so anyway, 2014 is going to be a real, real, real big year. Uh, in addition to these two major initiatives, of course, we're going to elect all of our constitutional offices. We will elect uh, all 80 members of the Assembly and half the members of the State Senate. Uh, and so it's going to be a, a very, very big year. And the last thing I'll say before I close here is that, you know, we could not do any of this. We could not represent your interests. We could not make sure that agents were playing a meaningful role in the exchange. We couldn't enact meaningful workers' comp reform. We couldn't do any of the things that we do for you without your membership, without your support. We have depended and been very successful over the years uh, uh, by having excellent lobbyists and other representatives in the legislature uh, and in the Department of Insurance, having spectacular grassroots capabilities because of you and your relationships in your communities, and then having our PAC funds as well. And I just want you to know that uh, we uh, so, so value your membership. We don't take uh, your support for granted, and uh, we just appreciate everything you do to make the association uh, so effective in Sacramento and, uh, as I'd like to say, other places of evil. <laughs> and with that? Mr. President, that, uh, that uh, happy to answer any questions once we get to the Q&A portion. Yeah, we'll get to that in a, in a minute here. We're going to now uh, turn it over to Clark and let Clark come right. in. Thanks, Dan. And I'll just continue to follow along with what, what Steve ended with there. And, and um, 
to make some comments about our plan and what we've got um, uh, focused on and, and from a strategic standpoint for 2014. And as Steve was saying, a primary value of IIB Cal membership is being a part of the effort to accomplish objectives otherwise unattainable by members individually, which is the, the key component of, of the association's mission statement. And that concept starts with legislative affairs. In other words, we do it for you so you can use your time to do what you do best, and that's sell insurance and take care of your clients. We speak on your behalf with the collective voice of all IIB Cal members. And then that concept also applies to the regulatory affairs. As Steve was talking about with the Department of Insurance, et cetera, we've built a professional and credible relationship with the insurance commissioner and the, the CDI professional staff. And again, we take that lead so you can use your time to do what you do best. So the unity concept also drives our conference-based networking and training initiatives. The Blue Ribbon Conference and InsureFest attract top industry reps and the best of the best member brokers and agents, which other associations can't replicate um, these type of unique events, and which provide these unequaled learning opportunities, again, because of our collective um, uh, association membership, we can attract uh, those type of participants and, and um, um, content, et cetera. So it, it is all a part of this um, accomplishing, accomplishing objectives uh, together that we can't do individually. There's three primary strategic targets in, a, in our 2014 uh, strategic plan. One is a, a targeted membership development. We are, have built a, a membership development campaign that works with local associations to identify member prospects that recognize and appreciate the value of the association's efforts. So we're going to work more with, um, with the locals and, and with our members to, to go out and um, find and, and bring into the association those that do recognize this value of, of being a part of the larger group. We're also focused on, on building a sustainable organization it's obvious that the California business environment is changing at a vigorous pace and will continue to review and analyze members' needs to make sure IIB Cal is positioned as a valuable resource for, for members. Our vision is to deliver experiences that members perceive as uniquely valuable. And then third, identify, attract, and train new agency employees. It's critical we develop an education pipeline to attract productive employees for independent insurance agency members. It's not an easy task. Um, it's hard to get the, our arms around how we actually do that, but we're, we're focused to, to try to help members, again, identify, attract, and train um, because the future of the independent agency system is, is really at stake, and we need to figure out how to do this. And so we're, we're putting um, effort in this uh, with not only a state basis, but also working on a national uh, level with the independent insurance agents and brokers of America. The 2014 IIB Cal business plan is attached to this meeting's online agenda, so I invite you to take a look at the plan and let me know if you have any questions and or comments. Uh, it's a continuous improvement process. Um, the planning process has changed from the old days where it used to be that you'd have a plan for one year, three years, five years. Um, it, it really has become a, a ongoing process where we look at this plan um, throughout the year and tweak it and, and update it as needed uh, depending on what's going on around us so we don't operate or tr uh, get caught up operating in a vacuum. So IIB Cal welcomes your input and participation because it's, that, that's really what makes it work. As Steve said, the grassroots effort on the legislative affairs, it's, it's the collective nature uh, of all of us working together um, for these, uh, to, to reach these different objectives is how this thing works. So um, and the next couple of slides we've got here for you, uh, I just wanted to point out that there is a, um, some reference there to some membership resources available to IIB Cal members. And then the following um, slide also lists um, our priority events for 2014. So take your pick, and we hope to see you at uh, one or all of these events in 2014. And also want to remind everybody that we've got a a lot of information uh, on our website about membership services, events, education, and, and a lot more. And you can find that information at www.iiabcal.org.
So with that uh, tab, I think it's time to uh, answer some questions. Uh, if we've got any come in here. Okay. Um, Steve, you know, there, there's a couple of questions here about, uh, you know, this, the legislative process, and you, and you mentioned um, 2013 and kind of what, what we're looking ahead in 14 with uh, a lot of new members and new roles. It is, um, the, the question is, is the association do anything different than they have in the past in terms of lobbying and PAC, or, or is it just kind of more of the same and just trying to deal with the new environment? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, Clark. Uh, one, you know, wh one of the uh, 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 one of the additional sort of circumstances we're seeing with all the new members is that uh, many of the of the new legislators are extraordinarily young. Uh, maybe I'm saying more about my own advancing age here than anything else, but it just seems like there are some children in the legislature right now. And so, you know, one of the things that, uh, for example, our lobbyist, John Norwood, has done uh, is to bring younger people onto his staff. You know, his daughter has now joined the firm and has won uh, major reviews for her just uh, ability to immediately hit the ground running and be effective. And, and he, John has brought in other younger people who can relate a little bit better with some of these younger legislators. But by and large, the, you know, the process uh, of lobbying is heavily dependent upon, uh, you know, the personal relationships that are formed and the personal reputations that get developed over time. And, you know, one of the things we've been as an association and as a business group so fortunate, uh, you know, to have uh, John Norwood uh, working in our behalf really since the late 1970s because he has uh, a reputation uh, established over a long period of time and very well deserved for being so smart, so knowledgeable about these issues, so honest that he has uh, immense credibility on both sides of the partisan aisle. Uh, and uh, so that, that endures notwithstanding the other changes that happen from time to time. Uh, and, and the one other thing I'll say about the legislature is that one consequence of the term limits initiative is that we're probably going to see you know, really significantly new leadership, not only in the Senate and Assembly in terms of the overall, you know, people running it, but in the insurance committees as well. Uh, Senator Ron Calderon, of course, uh, from the Los Angeles area, who has been the chairman of the Senate Insurance Committee, is under, uh, you know, FBI investigation and has been stripped of his committee chairmanship. And so that committee will have uh, very significant new leadership going forward. The one other resource I might uh, call it, uh, everyone's attention to, by the way, on our website, um, as others have noted, we have some additional background information. But one of the things we've posted is a really detailed report uh, on the 23 legislative session, which John Orr's office has prepared. Uh, th this report forms the basis of the new laws briefing course that we do every year. But it provides a really extensive summary of kind of what happened in the 23 legislature and a bill by bill sort of summary of the key uh, measures that we were following. You can see there are hundreds of bills uh, with little sort of snapshot summaries. So I, I really commend that report. It's excellent uh, to anyone who wants more information. OK. Um, there's a, another question here about. Um, it looks like the event. I guess it has to do with the the event list there and Insurefest. Um, what? Uh, how is Insurefest different, or what, um, what? What? What did the conference? It, it used to be the uh, Young Brokers and Agents Conference, and um, last two years ago we reformatted uh, that conference to be more uh, a bit more broad in scope um, in terms of the agenda and content. Um, and, and focus more than just on the sales um, end of uh, end of the things. It used to be focused on a again the young agent, and we, and we changed it uh, to to really attract anyone who was kind of in line or or was uh, thinking about a, a more of a ownership or management role within an agency. So the content uh, and the program uh, scheduling has really been broadened in that regard. So it's more than what it used to be. And, um, and actually, the attendance has grown 
uh, again, more than just outs or outside of that young agent group. Um, also a question about the products, um, service corp products. Um, yeah, if you, uh, is a, the one slide listed some benefits there, and uh, we do as an association offer several insurance program products that are available for uh, members in some cases that they, they use themselves as an insurance agency, as in the um, um, errors and emissions program. Uh, the association has two programs uh, for E&O. One is with Swiss Re Westport, and that's part of a national program um, that was developed by insurance, independent insurance agents for independent insurance agencies, and then also with uh, Fireman's Fund, an E&O program. And, and, and again, uh, that program has been specifically designed for California independent insurance agencies. So um, that's an example of, of a, a product that we provide members to use themselves, and then we also provide a, um, several programs, products that members uh, have access to for their clients, such as uh, commercial earthquake, residential earthquake, um, EPL, new, new cyber liability policy, et cetera. So please take a, a look at that, and um, on our website there's details, um, applications, um, the whole bit, and, and again, if you have any questions, uh, give us a call at our 800 number. Um, 800-772-8998, and we can answer any of those questions. Right, Clark? Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, do you want to touch on some of the, on the you, you touched on the product side of that. Do you want to touch on a little bit the, the business service side of it? Uh, uh, yeah. You know, like in the you know, Office Depot and the Wave and some of those discounted uh, programs that we have available. Yeah, thanks, Tab. And as Tab said there, we do have a number of products that help you also operate your agency. Um, office Depot, There's a, you can get a discount off of all your office products just by um, going through or using a code using um, our program to order uh, um, your office products, and it comes the same way. You can even, um, if you pick up and go into Office Depot, you can get that discount as well as ordering and having them delivered. So um, Agility Recovery is, a, is another um, program that uh, many of our members have utilized, and that is a disaster recovery um, support. And um, again, all, all of those are listed on our website, and I encourage you to go take a look at those. Um, we got another question here about what, are, what is IIBCAL doing to attract new talent to our industry? Um, College fairs, internships, um, invest is um, listed here, um, and and that's a good question, good point. And and as I tried to mention, um, there's a as a part of a planning um, process at the national association as well as the state association. Um, there's been various uh, oh um, attempts uh, or initiatives of, of how to try to make insurance sexy, um, especially to uh, young people coming out of college, etc. Um, and INVEST is a national program that was started aimed at high school students and has been expanded into the college, uh, college level at the community college level. Um, the challenge has been um, how to get someone interested in insurance, um, how to get them on track and, and educated, um, trained from an insurance standpoint, and then most, most importantly, how to, how to connect that circle um, to, to their employment in an independent insurance agency member um, agency. Um, in many cases, there's been even invest as, as, um, as they've tracked some of the people that have gone through that program. Um, they, they end up working for an insurance company or they end up w working for some other insurance industry um, um, organization. And while that's all well said and good on, on one level, um, we're, we're trying to dial in specifically so that we can work with um, our members to, again, not only, um, first of all, you've got to identify a candidate and then attract them into the, you know, the, the system. And um, we're looking at ways of how to help fund that. Um, there's been various uh, insurance company um, training programs over time um, that have worked to some d degree in certain areas of the country. Um, that's uh, uh, part of the initiative at the national that that's the, that they're reviewing and, and discussing is how do you build some type of a national training that then can be a feeder um, system, if you will, into various parts of the of the country. 
Um, we've looked at uh, various programs or how to get insurance schools started at, um, at the California state level, for instance. Um, but if we were able to do that at Sacramento State, how does that benefit a, a, a member agency maybe in San Diego? Um, so there's a lot of different um, components that we're reviewing, but it is um, a, a, an objective that we need, like I said, we need to figure it out. So we're, we're definitely going to be looking at that, of, of how we can come up with some, um, some resources in that area. Um, question on the insurance commissioner race um, uh, in 2014. Steve, you want to maybe comment about it? We've got one of our own, Ted Gaines, an insurance uh, member of the association. Uh, running against um, um, the incumbent, Dave Jones, um, maybe use that as an example of how we um, uh, help uh, those legislators that are that support our business interests. Yeah, we're we're really uh, uh, you know the association typically does not make endorsements in partisan elections, uh, and and the reason we do that, or, or that we don't do that, really is twofold. One, we, we've never felt that our members really needed our help in making partisan, you know, decisions for themselves. They don't need our help doing that. And number two, when we have tried or when we have ventured into those um, fields, uh, I have been struck personally by how we we have pretty much an unbroken track record. Uh, we we are we have a perfect record of always picking the losing candidate, <laughs> and so in order to uh, kind of avoid making those mistakes, we we try to make as much information about the candidate, about their position on business issues generally, and issues to us specifically as we possibly can to our membership and then let them make whatever decisions they think are appropriate for themselves and for their own clients. But certainly one part of our um, overall advocacy success is encouraging members who are interested politically, be they Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, to get involved in the process. And Ted Gaines is really one, I think, perfect example of that. Uh, a uh, guy who started out uh, working for his Sacramento County Board of uh, Supervisors uh, and then has slowly advanced. He was a, an assemblyman in the Sacramento and northeast uh, regions of the state and is now the state senator from the big first uh, Senate district, which includes part of Sacramento and really goes all the way up to the Oregon border. And he has announced his candidacy uh, for the Republican nomination for insurance commissioner. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, Ted understands that he has a very formidable uh, race ahead of him. Uh, you know, he's never been a statewide candidate before, so he is unknown uh, largely outside of his district. He'll be running against Dave Jones as a candidate who has immense name recognition, immense uh, uh, financial support. Uh, all of the inherent uh, advantages of de all the uh, you know Democratic voter registration and the Democratic sort of electoral machine it is it is back so it's going to be a very very difficult race but uh, you never know what happens in politics one uh, and number two uh, even if uh, you know Senator Gaines was unsuccessful he you know he may very well be laying the groundwork for something future uh, either it, for insurance commissioner or something larger so. Uh, we certainly wish Ted well, uh, even though we may or may not make uh, an official uh, endorsement in that race. Any other questions on there, Clark? Um, Clark? Yeah, no, just looking. Um, yeah, again, another comment about um, attracting uh, a, a diverse, uh, diverse employees to uh, to agencies to respond to the diversity of the uh, changing California um, insurance buyer. Um, and again, I think that's a part of what we were talking about um, in, in developing a, a, um, a program that can, again, attract um, people into the industry. And um, part of that is uh, a, a competing with other industries. Um, uh, and and everybody's looking for for new employees and and again productive employees. So that the, the diversity is a big part of uh, of what the game plan will ultimately be in terms of attracting productive employees to to an agency. Um, 
Not another one here about the legislative process, and I, and I and again I, I just go back to what Steve was saying. I think, you know, what we do as an association is so much dependent on our members being involved at that grassroots level. And as Steve mentioned, the relationship aspect of this, you know, can't be overstated. Um, whether it's to um, to support a local uh, candidate uh, in in delivering a pack check to, to support. Um, the efforts to, for, for an election, um, whatever it is, those relationships are what um, are important. And, and, and what I learned early on is, you know, the whole uh, PAC process is really uh, to, to help the legislator know that he's got somebody to go to if he's got questions on insurance issues. It's really buying their ear is all, all we're trying to do. And as Steve mentioned, we've got a, um, a very credible uh, position in Sacramento of being uh, fair and providing information to legislators when they need it in order to make decisions on um, uh, proposed legislation that deals with insurance. So uh, that's very important to us is that we communicate in a, in a fair uh, a fair method what's what we think about an insurance issue so that that legislator has the information he needs in order to make a decision on how to vote on um, specific legislation so but but you can't again overstate the the importance of relationships and and everything's local so the more local we can make it um, the more beneficial it's going to be okay um, I think that's that's the majority of the questions. All right. Well, um, since there's no further questions, I want to I want to make sure everybody knows that um, there will be a recording of today's webinar available on the website uh, later today. And finally, I want to thank all of you for participating in in today's webinar and for your continued membership in IIAB Cal and on into. 2014. We are able to do what we do because of your support and we can't thank you enough for that support. So thank you all very much for attending today's webinar and that concludes our event.